going to talk about what happens to language. There's a chart there, a very important chart there, of the language of deception. One of the very important parts of the exhibition is what they said, what they meant, and what they did. They used clean language. Resettlement in the East. Liquidation. They told themselves they were doing one thing. And even we use clean language. We sometimes say people perished at Auschwitz. People did not perish at Auschwitz. They were murdered at Auschwitz. And you have to look at the games people can play with language. Auschwitz was unique in the Nazi camps. It was unique, in fact, and it relates directly to what the Freedom Center was about because it was unique because it really was three camps in one. Easy for us to remember because camp number one was called Auschwitz I. Camp number two was called Auschwitz II and camp number three was called Auschwitz III. Auschwitz I was a prison colony, and Auschwitz III was also known as Bunomanowitz. It was a series of subcamps in which German corporations invested 700 million Reichsmarks in 1942 on the expansion of the, and the creation of industries at Auschwitz. It doesn't take a great banker or a great corporate leader in Cincinnati as the home of banks and corporations to understand that a corporation doesn't invest 700 million Reichsmarks, which was $400 million then, perhaps as much as $12 billion today, with the idea that they are going to gain that money back in a year or two years. They built the slave system at Auschwitz to last and they expected slavery to be a constant part of the German economy and of the Nazi vision. And those decisions were not made by Nazi officers. They were made in corporate boardrooms in places like Frankfurt and Munich, not in Berlin, and certainly not on the spot. And Auschwitz too was known as Birkenau. It was a death camp. By that we mean that people arrived in Auschwitz, they then arrived in Auschwitz from the ghettos, they faced selection. Normally we all want to be chosen, those of us who are guys and girls who played on teams. Remember when in the schoolyard we used to choose teams and everybody would say, select me, choose me. You want to be chosen first and not last, they faced selection. A physician would go with a wand and say to the right and to the left, and that meant the difference between life and death, but you did not win or which. The elderly were sent to the death, the very young were sent to their death, women with children were sent to death, and if they needed workers, those were the only people who were sent to live. When they came there, the dead had their property confiscated, their hair shaven, their teeth taken, their valuables stolen, and within an hour or two, they were ashes. Their burial place, the sky. Those who worked were branded and sheared, and they were therefore lost their names and they lost their identities, they lost things that are vital to our own humanity the clothes that we wear, the hair that we comb, the names that we bear. And then they faced an ordeal of labor and the idea was that they were going to work them to death or to near death and then ship them from Buna Manovitz back to, <coughs> ship them from Buna Manovitz back to Birkenau where once they were no longer useful to the German economy, they would be disposed of, destroyed. And I remind you that this was not some barbarian act. This was the act of the most civilized, the most cultured of all Western civilizations. 
in the 1930s and 40s, it implicates our science, our music, our literature, our philosophy, our humanity, our religiosity. Auschwitz represented the nadir of human existence, and it was for the first time that slavery, the human being, was reduced to a consumable raw material to be discarded in the, manufacture, in the process of manufacture and recycled into the economy. For its victims, Auschwitz represented and survivors were only part of its victims. Most of its victims never lived to tell the story. For its victims, the task was, how do you live in a society that is designed without rhyme nor reason not to enhance life but to destroy life? Primo Levi said, here there is no why. And how do you find a strategy for survival in an institution that is designed to destroy you in its entirety? Listen to the testimonies. Look at the text, watch the pictures, and see if you can discern how one lives under such circumstances. The words themselves, what? They shatter us. I came from California where it was 75. I used the word when I arrived in Cincinnati, cold. It meant I should put on my jacket. They got cold in October, they got warm again in May, and every hour of every day between October and May, they were cold in such a way they could never be comfortable. I use the word hungry, it means I really should have a meal. They got hungry in 41, wait again in 45, and only after they ate, some of them could not tolerate food anymore. So you're going to learn in this the experience of the what it's like to live there, you're gonna enter those gates, not only unlock those gates. You're gonna enter those gates and see what it was like to be there. The last element of that was the death marches. We've spoke upon that. But then we have to talk about the incredible journey of survivors afterwards. We live in a world where victimization leads to rage, and rage leads to violence, wanton violence, anger and fury at the entire world that takes itself out in wanton murder again and again and again. What did the survivors do? In the aftermath of death and destruction, they opted for life. They dared, those who had lost family, dared to, lost wives and children, dared to marry again and have children again. For Jews, the most important aspect of that history is that they dared to bring Jewish children into a world which had only days, weeks, and months before made being Jewish the reason why one was killed. A story. There was a man that I interviewed who was a professor of Talmud. He was a mole, a ritual circumciser in Boston. Some of you know enough about baseball to know how deeply that the uh, Boston Red Sox fans adore the New York Yankees. <laughs> because of that, he was called, with all due, non-due apologies to Joe DiMaggio, he was called the Yankee Clipper. And I once asked him, where did you learn the ritual of circumcision? He said, I learned it from my father in the death camps. Because after, in the DP camps, after destruction, in the days and weeks and months after the Holocaust, people would come up who did not dare to circumcise their sons during the war and say, I want my son to bear the indelible sign of the covenant. And what did that mean? It meant very deeply that they were willing to take a chance on the future and to be an, make an indelible mark of being Jewish. And if you think of that, think of what it represents. People who have experienced death are able to recreate life. 
and they have enough faith, undeserved faith in the future to say I will indelibly and proudly mark this boy as a son of the covenant. But survivors went forward from there and what did they do? They came to places where they could live life in freedom. 